Hello, I'm Shanaz Castongate, VP at Clarius. Thanks for joining us for today's live practical small animal ultrasound webinar. We'll cover four urinary tract disease cases where POCUS improved patient management. Following her September webinar with us on gastrointestinal diseases, Dr. Camilla Edwards is back. In this session, Dr. Edwards will demonstrate hands-on POCUS techniques to assess the urinary tract and share cases of feline and canine kidney and bladder abnormalities and disorders uncovered with wireless ultrasound. First, I'd like to welcome you all. You're among peers from across the world. A big thank you to The Vet Show, NABC, and The Vet Webinar for inviting many of you to join us here today. You're among 2,800 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for this popular event. This webinar is race approved thanks to the vet show. So please do stay on for the full session to qualify for one CE CPD credit by participating for 50 minutes or longer. You'll receive an email from the vet show in the coming week to redeem your educational credit. Following the main presentation, Claris clinical manager, Shelly Gunther will be performing live scanning on her furry friend, Mabel. At any time during today's session, please use the Q and A box to ask your questions. We'll have a live question and answer session with Dr. Edwards following the presentation and live scanning. We'll now introduce you to your host. Dr. Aron Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Hi, Dr. Frankel. Hi, Janez. Thanks for having me here today. And to set the stage for our discussion, per usual, we did a broad literature review. If some of you have been to some of our other veterinary webinars, we'll have seen some of the issues we've covered. And what we usually hit on is that in general, veterinary ultrasound really has a wide range of uses and applications. So today we're going to focus it in on more abdominal ultrasound and specifically for urinary tract complaints, where ultrasound really can provide enormous power in investigating various pathologies and clinical conditions, particularly as you'll see ureteral obstruction and cystitis. And even beyond just kind of the general applications, ultrasound can also add specificity to certain diagnoses. For example, specific characteristics noted in imaging can suggest the diagnosis of transitional cell carcinomas in both feline and canine patients once you know the features to look for. And lastly, beyond simple diagnostic imaging, we'll also cover ultrasound can assist providing image guidance both for potential making the diagnosis, but also helping make the procedure safer and more accurate. So before we jump into the further meat of the, today's study, we wanted to put out a poll to all of you. We know we have practitioners from all over the world at various stages of practice. And today we're wondering if you don't use ultrasound in your daily practice, what reasons are in the way or preventing you from doing that? Is it that the machines are too expensive, complex to use? Maybe you don't have the experience in-house with sonography or feel like you can't get adequate training. We'll leave this up for another couple seconds here and then we'll close it out just to see where everybody's at. And so we can see that people really are kind of across the board, particularly around the lack of training options and don't have the experience in-house, which is so great why you are here at today's webinar, because we can't think of anyone better to help guide us on this journey than Dr. Camilla Edwards, who's passionate about first opinion level, small animal veterinary ultrasound, travels with her dog Pippi within 50 miles of Cambridge as a peripatetic veterinary ultrasonographer. Camilla teaches ultrasound with Celtic SMR, Photon Surgical Systems, and FOVU, and has built a thriving Facebook community for first opinion small animal vets that I'm sure many of you are already members of. Through her website, she reviews ultrasound machines with general practice small animal vets in mind. Camilla qualified as a vet in 2006 and she's worked all over East Anglia, UK, where she's explored and used her experience in emergency and critical care, having gained her CERT AVP in 2018. Dr. Camilla Edwards, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Oren. Um, it's so great to be back here. Um, it's always a pleasure talking at these web webinars. Um, before we move on, I need to just tell you about that I'm receiving an honorarium for this webinar. Um, so this is such a great topic, um, the urinary tract. It's one of those uh, places where people often start to use ultrasound um, in uh, veterinary medicine because the bladder is so easy to find, but we can get so much more out of um, scanning the kidneys also. So we'll have a look at both of those today. 
So we're going to have a little look at um, exactly what we're aiming to assess and look at um, using ultrasonography. Um, so what's normal? We'll talk about what's abnormal. And then we've got four great cases uh, to demonstrate some abnormalities and how we would go about looking at those um, abnormalities um, as we go along. So first of all, the normal urinary tract. When it comes to looking at kidneys, um, we are assessing the cortex, the medulla and the peripelvic region, including the, the pelvis itself, um, and really assessing for the, the, the overall size of the kidney, the proportions between the cortex and the medulla um, should be similar. They should be similar in thickness. We're also thinking about echogenicity, so the cortex should be hyperechoic relative to the medulla um, and the peripelvic region is quite bright usually, but the um, pelvis itself is, is quite um, hypoechoic or even anechoic as it's fluid filled, um, but very, very small, very tiny. When it comes to the urinary bladder, we're assessing that wall. Um, so looking at that wall thickness in a cat, we'd expect the wall thickness to be about 0.13 to 0.17 centimetres. And in a dog, depending on how full the bladder is, uh, somewhere between 0.14 centimetres when it's very full and down to 0.23 centimetres when it's empty. But that can be make it quite difficult to assess if, if it's empty. So we really want a, a full bladder to assess if we can. And then we're really interested in the lumen content in the bladder. So we're looking at that and uh, for that anechoic fluid with its acoustic enhancement beneath it to prove that it's fluid. Um, and we're looking for sediment free content. So what abnormalities are we looking at? Well, I like to um, really narrow it down to specifics that we're looking at so that we can assess things. So um, when it comes to the size um, of the kidneys in uh, dogs, we're looking um, anywhere from about four centimetres to eight centimetres in, um, in length um, of the kidneys. Uh, you can get outliers uh, if it's a particularly tiny dog or a particularly large dog, but most dogs will fall into that uh, between four and eight centimetres. Um, and obviously smaller dogs will have smaller kidneys and larger dogs will have large kidneys. Um, in cats, most of them fall between three and a half and four and a half centimetres in length. Um, so that's what we're looking out for. If we've got a large kidney, so we've got renomegaly, um, larger than expected for the size of animal that we've got, that, that often happens in acute kidney injuries. We get an acute injury and in the kidney is bigger. If it's a smaller kidney, that's often where we've got chronic disease present. The same goes for the bladder. We're thinking about the size of the bladder. Is it dilated or is it empty? And is that appropriate for the behavior of the animal? So um, often in male dogs, we'll see very empty bladders because they're constantly marking their territory. Um, so we expect to see an empty bladder. If we've got a, a an animal that is, is constantly leaking urine, but um, has a very distended bladder, then we're, we've got to be very concerned about that, um, that there may be some sort of obstruction or, or reason for that. Um, so really think about the history as well, what's going on with the animal, is it appropriate? Um, echogenicity, we're expect expecting the cortex to be hyperechoic relative to the medulla. Um, but we, we're we not expecting it to be super bright. So again, if we've got an acute toxicity um, or an acute kidney injury, the cortex can often be quite bright um, and um, that, that will stand out quite uh, prominently. Um, and when it comes to echogenicity of the bladder lumen content, uh, we, we, if we've got a urolith, for example, um, we'll have a very hyperechoic area with an acoustic shadow beneath it. We also want to look at the margins of our organs. So when it comes to the kidney, we're thinking about looking for these really smooth or regular margins. We're expecting them to be very, very smooth. And if they're irregular, is that because there's a cyst or a mass or something else going on there? 
with the bladder, it's all about the wall thickness when it comes to margins. Um, is there a focal region that's more thick or um, is it a general thick thickening of the wall um, that, that's pathological there? So that's something to look out for. And finally, don't be afraid to um, look for flow. So um, if you have um, a, a suspected mass in the bladder, um, it's always good to put Doppler on to assess whether there is actually blood flow within that um, mass or whether it could in fact be a, a blood clot. Okay, so we're gonna first take a look at how to scan our left kidney. So I start down by the ziffy sternum with my probe and I follow the costal arch up. Um, I've got going past the stomach, I've got the spleen there, and the next organ I get to as I travel up that costal arch is the left kidney. So we can see that here. We've got the cortex, um, which is hyperechoic um, compared to the medulla. And you can see the bright um, pelvis in, in the center there. Um, and once we've got the longest view we can possibly get of the kidney, we want to take a measurement of that. We're only going to underestimate the length of the kidney. So we really want to just rotate slightly to try and get that longest length. Once we've got that, we can fan all the way through to the extremities. And then we want to rotate to get the transverse view and then fan all the way through that transverse view. It's really important to um, fan until we get to um, the extremities each time so that we're not missing um, a focal lesion on the edge. So fanning until the kidney disappears in both directions. Then we've checked um, two planes, which is what we want to do with all organs as we move along. So let's have a look at our first case. This was a six-year-old uh, female neutered dog who was imported from Greece. It was actually a number of years prior to this scan. Um, had travelled over and with a diagnosis of leishmaniasis, which was being treated with allopurinol, um, and recently had had um, some urinary tract symptoms and in a urinary sample had found capillaria plica or bladder. in this pelvis region, this hyperechoic, so this bright white area um, with an acoustic shadow beneath it. And this um, acoustic shadow is occurring because the sound waves are hitting something mineralized here and being completely reflected. So no sound waves are making it down to this area. So we, we have an, a, a large nephrolith here. And here we can see, again, we're just fanning through in this longitudinal view, um, this, this nephrolith taking up a, a large portion of the pelvis there. It really looks almost like a bone inside the kidney, the way it's shadowing there. It, it really does. It was uh, quite a surprise to find, um, I have to say. So, yeah, we, we want to fan through there. We're fanning through in longitudinal um, and we really want to turn the probe and fan through in, in transverse. So we can see that nephrolith in, in both planes. It's not an artifact, although we're probably not in doubt because it's such a huge nephrolith. Sometimes we can be um, a little bit um, uh, concerned that we might be seeing a refraction artifact instead of a curved surface and not a true uh, nephrolith. But uh, seeing it in both planes helps us to assess that. We also had um, the bladder um, in, our, in our thoughts. So we scanned the bladder and we found this large um, hyperechoic uh, region within the lumen of the bladder. Um, so we, we had two thoughts in mind, really. Could this be a blood clot or could this be a mass? 
Um, so the important things to sort of differentiate between that is to assess the mobility of this. Um, was it something that was um, adherent somewhere um, or was it something that was loose and, and floating around in the bladder? So one way to do that is to change the recumbency of the animal so that we can see if it falls to the dependent side. Um, and then the other is to apply colour Doppler um, so that we can see if there's um, any flow in the area, um, which there wasn't in this case. So a blood clot's not going to have any flow in it, whereas a mass might. Um, it, you might not always pick up on it. It depends on the sensitivity of, of your ultrasound machine. But in this case, this was a blood clot. Um, and, and that's usually secondary um, to, to something else, whether that's the nephrolis or whether that's due to the bladder worms, we weren't sure in this case. Um, so this dog um, had nephrolithiasis in both kidneys. There was no sign of dilated ureters, so this wasn't causing a blockage. Um, and um, through, through our research, we felt that the allopurinol was the most likely cause of the nephrolithiasis. And this uh, paper that I'm, I've put down at the bottom, um, adverse urinary effects of allopurinol in dogs with leishmaniasis was a, a, a key helper in us getting to that conclusion. Um, the bladder contained a large blood clot and we were able to um, refer for surgery to remove the nephrolis. The uh, local um, referral centre um, claimed to be able to remove nephrolis as long as they were smaller than six centimetres, which I thought was quite impressive. OK, so that was the left kidney. Let's have a look at the right kidney, which is a bit harder to um, to scan, um, truthfully, because it is further cranial um, it's in its positioning. So it's under the ribs. We slide up the costal arch as before, but if you notice how my probe is lying quite flat, I'm actually having to look um, quite deep under those ribs. We can look between the ribs, but we'll often get rib shadows. So we just need to get the best of, of both of these either looking um, from behind the ribs or between the ribs. And again, we want to measure the length of the kidney and try and fan through in two planes. Um, so we're fanning through the longitudinal view here and then trying to rotate the probe to get a transverse view. From behind the ribs, we're going to get a slightly oblique view here. Um, but in transverse, then we want to fan again all the way through. So case number two was a female neutered 10 year old uh, domestic shorthead cat with a history of weight loss, chronic enteropathy and hepatopathy and also hypothyroidism. So quite a list of things going on. We, um, we were scanning the whole abdomen, so we were not particularly concerned about the kidneys, but um, once we were scanning the kidneys, we, we found some abnormalities. So first of all, we were measuring the length, um, normal length kidney here for a cat, um, 3.8 centimetres, normally expect them to be about three and a half to four and a half, so nothing unexpected there. However, when we start to take a closer look at the kidneys, we can see the cortex, which we expect to be hyperechoic compared to the medulla, which um, it, it mostly is, but it's extremely hyperechoic in these wedges here. Um, so we have uh, these wedges where we have a thinner end towards uh, the medulla and a thicker end out towards the edge uh, or the margin of the kidney. And also where um, this wedge meets the margin, it's contracted uh, the, the margin of the, the kidney. So this is typical for uh, infarcts within the kidney. So here again, we can fan through in longitudinal to see those, those infarcts, quite impressive infarcts there. We've got a transverse view of the kidney here, and we can see that real dip on the margin of the kidney where that infarct, that wedge is fanning through in transverse. We can see again, those, those infarcts. 
And we want to assess whether we can see that in, in both kidneys. Um, so, so measuring both kidneys um, and repeating on both kidneys is important to assess whether, whether that distribution is on both sides. Um, and again, we, this, this one had a very large infarct there present. So in cats in particular, it can be quite difficult to assess which kidney we've actually got. Um, because in skinny cats, we can see both kidneys um, um, from both sides. So here we've got one kidney here and the other here. So fanning through the abdomen, um, you can see how close they are and actually how close to the surface the opposite side's kidney is. But scanning like this, we can assure, ensure that we've seen both kidneys and that we have, we can see the abnormality in both kidneys also. So yeah, take, taking the measurements and it's always worth repeating um, because you're, you're um, only ever going to underestimate the length of the kidney. So the more times you repeat it, you can take the longest length as the true length of the kidney. And again, fanning through, we can really see these, these infarcts. So in both kidneys, we saw hyperechoic wedges with a thick end um, in the cortex and the thin end towards the medulla. These are usually chronic infarcts, and it's important in these cases um, to assess um, the heart um, because uh, cardiomyopathy, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, is much more likely um, to be um, present in these cats. Okay, so moving on to um, bladder scanning. So we have um, our bladder here. It's where we, where we expect it to be in the caudal abdomen. We're looking in longitudinal um, with our probe facing cranial and caudal. And we're fanning through in this longitudinal view, again, until the, kid, uh, until the bladder disappears in both both ways, so up or down, or left and right. And then we want to rotate the probe in, so it's in transverse. So we have the transverse bladder here, we have the transverse colon um, deep in the image, and we fan uh, cranially until the bladder disappears, and then cordially and, until the bladder disappears. And sometimes we need to slide a little bit cordially as well to get right to the end of the bladder. With the bladder, we want to add in one more view, and that is the gravity-dependent view. So because we might get sludge or sediment or uroliths, we want to assess the part of the bladder where the, um, those stones would fall to, and that is the, the uh, far field image down here at the bottom. Um, so if we aim the probe down through the bladder, down towards the table, then we will see uroliths in the bottom of our image if they are present. So case number three, uh, we had a, a female neutered 11-year-old um, German Shepherd dog uh, with a history of hematuria and inappropriate ur urination. So here we've got our bladder um, and we're in transverse. We can see this uh, transverse colon here and we're fanning cordially and what we can see as we found cordially is this uh, protrusion from the uh, wall of the bladder into the lumen of the bladder. So it's important to note that the bladder looks very normal in most of the time here. And it's not until we get very caudal in the bladder that we notice this protrusion. So it's so essential to fan all the way until the bladder disappears in each direction. So this is down towards the trigone area of, of our bladder. So here we've got the, the bladder and we're focused on that protrusion there. Um, and a longitudinal view, and this is what um, we, we might often be tempted to do is just place the probe on the bladder um, take one view and, and assess the bladder on that, but we'd be missing out on a lot. We need to fan all the way through um, in both directions until the bladder disappears. So here we've again got the bladder, but we're looking more longitudinally 
And we can see this is the caudal bladder with this mass here. And we can see it extends down the urethra here, um, which um, it, it is not so good for the dog because it makes surgical removal much harder. But it's important to be able to assess that. Um, so getting that longitudinal view and not just the transverse view is also important because that changes what we what we see and what we were able to do with the case. I would say that's a general principle, wouldn't you, that getting the two views, you know, in, in cross-sectional imaging and really sweeping through the entire organ of interest, area of interest? Absolutely. That That's key with most every organ that we do. Um, and the bladder just has that one extra view that, that we care about is the gravity dependent view also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we can see this this mass here. The, the rest of the wall looks very normal and it's really just in this caudal bladder in the trigone area that we see this, this mass. So the most common mass in the trigone area of the bladder is a transitional cell carcinoma. Um, um, we can use a BRAF test um, to um, test this. This is a relatively new test where we can um, have a look at, at the urine um, and um, it's fairly um, sensitive and specific for transitional cell carcinomas, particularly if we've seen a mass on um, ultra, ultrasound. We could also do um, um, traumatic catheterization. That would be um, my next step if, if BRAF was un inconclusive. Um, to try and get some cells. And I, I will often use um, ultrasound to help guide me with that so that I know I'm collecting cells from the right region. Um, and finally, we could do a fine needle aspirate of the lesion, again, ultrasound guided, but I would attempt the other uh, methods first because uh, we have the risk of seeding when it comes to transitional cell carcinomas. So let's have a look at how to perform a cystocentesis. Um, many of us will have learned how to do cystocentesis blind, um, but introducing ultrasound um, can really, really make things safer. So um, here we've got a phantom with a bladder within it. And I'm just setting up the um, image so that I'm getting an optimal image. So we can see the the bladder, which is within this, this phantom here on our screen. And we want to optimize our, our depth um, for cystocentesis. So um, we're really mainly focused on um, what is happening in this top left corner. We want to make sure our marker is pointing um, usually cranial on an animal, but we want to know where this marker is um, that um, reflects this. And from that marker, we want to measure down into the bladder um, to measure that distance. And we want to make sure we're a good way into the bladder um, in that measurement. That will tell us the needle length that we require um, because we don't want to be guessing what needle length and then not um, having a long enough needle to get into the bladder. It's the most common mistake I see when people are struggling with um, ultra, um, ultrasound guided cystocentesis. Also, we want to ensure that there's no um, big blood vessels in this region where we're going to um, stick our needle in. Um, and um, so we want to put color flow mapping on, color flow do Doppler on. Once we're sure of those things, um, we've got our needle length and we're sure that we've got no um, big blood vessels in the region, then we want to um, stick our needle in from this side, um, close to our probe, but not touching our probe. And we um, progress the needle as long as we can see the needle tip. If we lose the needle tip, we just need to fan slightly until the needle tip is shown again, and then we can progress again. So here our needles entering the bladder. And this is the point where we often feel we need another pair of hands um, to aspirate. And then we want to also watch as we slowly withdraw the needle. Okay. So let's have a look at a case where we did perform a, a cystocentesis. 
So this was um, a male neutered two year old domestic short haired cat with um, uh, urinary tract signs, um, a sort of typical um, feline urinary tract disease cat. So here, again, I just want to demonstrate that how easy it is to miss things if we don't fan all the way through. If we just get that one image of the bladder and even just move it slightly, move the probe slightly, all we're going to see is a thin bladder wall and an anechoic lumen in here. Um, so looking pretty normal there. If we fan all the way through, so we're fanning up there and we fan down, we can find this abnormality here. So we, we can see this sediment fanning up and fanning down. We see the sediment there. We can also, um, now I'm, I'm scanning in transverse, um, it moves the sediment to um, a different region on the image. Um, so we can see the sediment coming up on this side. So here is down um, and this side is up. Um, and that tells us that the, the sediment is falling to the dependent side. So here, again, we're focusing a little bit more on that sediment. So I'm giving the bladder a little bit of a shake. So that can um, sometimes help us see any swirling sediment. It helps us to know whether that's one big urolith. Um, if we were seeing a lot of uh, an acoustic shadow beneath it, we can see how mobile um, this is, how heavy it is. We can really get a feel for that on, on viewing ultrasound if we shake the bladder. How, how do you shake the bladder? Are you like pushing with the probe or tapping underneath the animal? Yeah, so I usually don't use the probe. Um, I usually use my other hand and slide it under the, the animal and then give that a little bit of a shake. I feel I've got more contact to know how, how much pressure I'm putting on if I'm using my hand directly on the animal. So there, that's my other hand, not the probe. Because um, I, I feel like that feels a bit violent using the probe. I do mm -hmm. know some people mm -hmm. do, do use it, but um, yeah, I prefer to use my other hand. So that can just help us to see any, um, any sediment that's swirling around. So here, again, we want to also assess when we move the animal over to the other side. Um, I often take a gravity dependent view again um, to see whether this is actually falling down to the, the dependent side, which it was in this case. And then I want to start uh, measuring um, um, how to how to get the cystocentesis. So I want to start to measure the bladder uh, for, or measure from this corner where my needle is going to enter down into the bladder. Now, I wasn't quite happy with this because I could see a loop of intestine here. So I really want to avoid that. So I, I want to get a better image where my bladder is um, more over in this left hand corner where I will be taking the sample from. So um, getting that bladder over to that side by moving the probe cordially, um, that, that helps me to get the, the image that I want. I can then uh, take this measurement, uh, it tells me what needle length I need. And I really want to make sure that my needle extends deep into the bladder. So often I see where it um, people are trying to take a sample and it's only just into the bladder. And actually what's happening is the wall is folding around the needle rather than the, the needle actually entering the bladder. So on the image, it looks like your needle is inside the bladder, but actually there's wall wrapped around it. Um, so you really need a long enough needle to penetrate that, that wall there. So here I'm taking a cystocentesis, so we can see our needle and the tip, and we can see the bladder reducing in size as I aspirate. And then following the needle as I pull the needle out. So in this case, um, the uh, bladder lumen um, hyperechoic areas with, with most likely crystals, but it's really important to figure out what type of crystals so that we can actually dissolve them with the correct diet. 
um, and hopefully, hopefully resolve um, the symptoms that the cat is having. Um, and so we perform this ultrasound guided cystocentesis. Um, many um, vets uh, were obviously taught how to do cystocentesis blind, but obviously we can avoid uh, the intestinal tract, we can um, avoid any blood vessels, um, and we can really see um, the length of needle that we need as well. So there's so, so many things about ultrasound that makes cystocentesis safer um, using it. So what are the take home messages today? So I think one of the key things is performing that systematic exam. So just by placing the probe on an organ, the organ can appear completely normal um, from certain views, unless we fan all the way through into planes, we're really not gonna be assessing the whole organ. Um, so doing that systematically every time we scan is really important. Characterizing the lesions. So thinking about that, those infarcts that we saw, not just describing them as, as white lines in the cortex, um, really thinking about how it's affecting the margins that they were sinking in, that's characteristic for infarcts, um, and that they were regions that were hyperechoic, thicker in the edge of the cortex and thinner um, towards the medulla. Um, these type of characteristics can really be pathognomic for uh, certain conditions. Um, so talking about the size, shape, position, echogenicity, margins, um, and the distribution um, are really key to characterizing those lesions. Taking measurements also um, a really, really key thing, um, particularly thinking about um, that measurement to um, take when we're about to perform an uh, ultrasound guided cystocentesis, um, I think is, is a really, really key one. If that's the only thing you take home today is take that measurement. Um, and use ultrasound guided sampling. It makes things safer than blind sampling. Um, so if you're doing that um, and you want to start doing fine needle aspirates, cystocentesis is a great place to start getting used to following your needle into an organ. Thanks for listening. Um, want to tell you a little bit about um, the courses that we run at FOVU. We've got um, four vet courses, scanning the emergency patient, the basics, the trickier bits, which are um, the basics and tricky bits are focused on the abdomen. If you're interested um, in today's topic, then the basics is a good place to start. And uh, we just started yesterday basic echocardiography for the GP vet, um, which um, has got 41 vets on. So um, they, there's still space on there if you want to join. And then we run a course for nurses and techs too. And thank you so much for watching. Um, if you head over to fovu.co.uk forward slash Clarius, um, we have a free ebook waiting for you over there. And we go through um, how to optimize your image, um, um, not just for Clarius, but for, for other machines as well and your basic machine setup. We'll also send you an independent Claris review um, and 10% discount off any FOBU course of your choice. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Camilla, for such an educational and informative set of slides. And I see a lot of people are already filling in the Q&A, which is great. We are going to get to that very shortly. So please keep using the Q&A tab. Uh, before we do that, we're going to hand it over to Shelly Gunther, our clinical marketing manager for a demo. Thanks, Aran, and thanks, uh, Camilla. You make it look so easy, as always. Um, I've got Mabel on the table over here, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to just uh, switch my camera over. Okay, hey, Mabel. Oh. Thank you. Stay. All right. So in the bladder preset, what I'm going to do here is just kind of start sagittal midline. And the other thing I'll do is just activate my voice controls just so that if Mabel starts to get a little bit squirmy, I can I can adjust my depth and gain and everything with, with no hands. So I can decrease depth, decrease depth. All right, so we're sagittal. Pretty much in the midline, I would say, right there, would you say, Dr. Edwards? Yep, 
So I can see a longitudinal colon. Um, so yeah, that the colon lies um, slightly to the left in the abdomen. Okay, so yeah. So, but that's always nice to see. It's a good marker for where we are um, compared to the other. And if I just rotate the scanner caudally, we're down at the base of the bladder at the trigone. And as Dr. Edwards suggested, we'll just scan side to side, left to right until we're out of the bladder. Decrease gain. Right. So once we've had a good look at that, um, still in this plane, what I can do is go up and look at that gravity dependent port uh, view where I scan almost straight up and down. And in this situation, the bladder, anything that's that's mobile or debris or calculi is going to be in the dependent part of the bladder here, which is toward the, the scanning bed. So it'll be really easy to see. And then one other trick that I like to use if I suspect that there's something in the bladder, um, I can increase gain, increase gain. And then that way, if we wiggle around a little bit and there is anything mobile in there, it'll show up a little bit brighter. It's not the best image of the bladder with the gain this high, but it definitely makes anything that's in there stand out a little bit more. Decrease gain, decrease gain. Good. So now I'm going to rotate the scanner 90 degrees and we'll get that transverse view of the bladder here. And again, we're getting that nice prominent colon view here that if I push hard, it can almost look like it's inside the bladder and kind of could mimic a big calculus or, or a nephrolith. So we want to make sure that we're not applying too much pressure. And again, scan all the way up till we're out of the bladder and then slowly all the way back down. And if I want to zoom that image a little bit, we can really see the detail in the bladder wall really nicely. And so freeze, if I wanted to measure the bladder wall, I could, I could get a really good measurement of that. Freeze. Good, and then we can just decrease our, our zoom here. So then what we can do now, if I want to go up and have a look up at her left kidney, just because she's on her right side, I'll go into the abdominal preset and it'll just make it nicer for soft tissue imaging. And we'll just head up right by the lumbar musculature and right away I'm seeing the kidney really nicely here. So I'm just going to decrease depth, decrease depth and decrease gain. And we can see the cortex, which is the darker kind of hypoechoic, and then these bright echoes within the renal medulla. And scan or fan through in long axis. If I wanted to do a measurement of that kidney, we could go freeze. I can go into my measurement tools. I could just select distance here and place my calipers. And as Dr. Edwards mentioned, we'd probably do three of these and take the largest because we're not going to, we'll never overestimate the size of the kidney, but we may underestimate it. And if we want, we can take a picture here. So if I unfreeze my image, again, what we want to do is rotate the scanner 90 degrees to fan through that kidney again. So here's the kidney in transverse. And what I'm seeing here is probably a rib with a big shadow. And I'm just going to scan through the kidney from top to bottom, just to make sure that that, and we're not seeing anything focal or any dilatation of the renal pelvis, which would be right in this area. We would see fluid here. And so as you can see, Mabel's waistline isn't quite as um, long as Pippi's. And so she's a little bit more, a little bit more challenging, but um, we're just with a little bit of practice, we can certainly, um, you know, by watching Dr. Edwards videos and 
and uh, getting an idea of how to find these structures and being familiar with what they're supposed to look like on ultrasound, it's, uh, it becomes easier and easier every time. And uh, getting to know what normal looks like will really help you to determine what when something is a myth. All Great. right. And practice, well, so practice. Much, Shelley. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. Thanks so much. Okay, excellent. Wow, look at all the Q&A. Uh, we are going to get to as many of those questions as we can very shortly. Uh, before we do, I'm going to hand it back over to Janez. Thank you, Dr. Frankel, Shelley, and thank you, Dr. Edwards. A reminder to stay on for at least 50 minutes to qualify for one CECPD credit. We're going to have a dynamic live Q&A starting shortly. We've got lots of questions. Do ask your questions using the Q&A box. Uh, before we get to your questions, there's a quick poll uh, that we'd like to provide to give you the opportunity to learn more about our Clarius wireless scanners. Uh, please do complete this poll. If you'd like us to provide more information, you can click on as many options as apply. Claris is available in over 90 countries. Pricing and availability does vary by region, so feel free to request a quote and pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option, and we can make more video tutorials available to you for veterinary medicine. Please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. And while you take a minute to participate in the poll, I'd like to tell you about our Clarius VET HD3 scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis and for safe procedural guidance for small, medium, and large animals. Our C3 HD3 micro convex VET scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C7 convex VET for larger animals like sheep and horses, and the L7 linear VET for superior animal MSK imaging, often used in equine applications. Our third generation family of VET scanners are unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Claris shows you the fine details you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam, and make a confident diagnosis on your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with not one or two, but eight beam formers and 192 elements that deliver the image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but for a fraction of the cost representing 85% savings. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons to optimize imaging and streamline workflows, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for ultimate portability to scan animals anywhere they are, from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it so much faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS and Android devices with free updates. Available with our membership, Claris Cloud is available to save and manage unlimited exams and create reports anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Claris classroom videos with experts like Dr. Edwards, as well as onboarding with Claris clinicians to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. With your membership, you get exclusive access to AI-powered features like voice controls, which you saw in action today. And you get our popular advanced veterinary package that offers more flexibility with additional tools and advanced workflows for various animal examinations, for example, with finely tuned presets categorized by anatomy, more comprehensive measurements, needle enhance for procedure guidance, and the new OB growth tables for both cats and dogs to obtain more accurate estimations of gestational age and fetal growth. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Clarius HD3 VET scanner, which is ultra affordable. We'll now close off the poll in three, two, one. Thank you. If you ask for more information, we'll get back to you in the coming week. Our last poll is your invitation to pre-register so that you can join us again for the next veterinary webinar. It's entitled Veterinary Pocus and Septic Peritonitis Ultrasound Findings in the Septic Abdomen. On January 23rd, the dynamic duo Dr. Soren Boysen and Serge Shaloub will join us for an informative presentation and video demonstrations as they guide us through the essential aspects of SP diagnosis, including key clinical indicators, pathophysiology, and the crucial role of ultrasound in early detection. I'll give you just a moment to save your seat. Three, 
two, one. Thank you. You will receive an email confirmation in the coming days if you asked us to save a seat for you. Let's now begin our live Q&A session. Please use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Dr. Edwards. Because this is a common question, I do want to let everyone know that in the coming days, we'll send you an email with a link to the recording for today's webinar and uh, a link to the, a PDF of the presentation. As well, if you stay on with us for at least 50 minutes, you'll receive an email with a link from the Vet Show to redeem your CECPD credit. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Frankel to moderate our Q&A session. All right, so many questions. We're gonna do our best to kind of blast through them and I will try and group some together uh, so we can answer a few at a time. Uh, first question, we've covered this in a prior webinar, but around cystocentesis, um, do you clean the gel off before you insert the needle? Absolutely, yeah. And obviously on the Phantom, I was using gel just as a coupling agent, but I would use um, alcohol or, or spirits, as we call it in the UK, um, um, to help with that. Um, but yes, no no gel because we don't want um, gel in our, our sample that we're sending to the lab. Um, it can cause cells to explode, so... <laughs> not very useful <laughs> to have Defeats in our the point. Defeats really the point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever do uh, FNAs of the kidney? Uh, yes. So if if you see see a mass in the kidney, it's a relatively safe um, procedure to do. Um, so yes, absolutely, we can do fine needle aspirates. Um, I um, had had a case recently that I um, took a sample. It's in the Claris Education um, section, actually, um, of a of a um, kidney that turned with with a large mass that turned out to be a carcinoma. Actually, in the end, um, but yes, yeah, you can absolutely take FNAs of kidneys. Is it a useful differentiation? And if so, how do you tell kidney stones from mineralization in the kidney? Yeah, so yeah, how useful is that difference or difference? I guess, you know, with a nephrolith, you, you're talking about the possibility of, of it being surgical or not. Um, so yeah, unlike in the bladder where we've got that large area, we can move things around and get a feeling for whether we've got multiple stones there or if we've got one large stone, that is harder to do um, in the kidney with ultrasound mm. because we can't move it around. So um, by scanning in two planes, um, we can see if there are any gaps um, where there's normal tissue in between that might signify that we've got smaller um, areas of mineralization, but yes, it's a lot harder to do in the, in the kidneys than it would be in the bladder. All right. Uh, we did cover the colon. Someone brought it up around the colon shadowing with the bladder, uh, of a stone. So that was good. Um, other ways to differentiate kind of hematoma from mass from sediment in the bladder. We talked about shaking yeah. anything, any other tricks? So yeah, it's it's a really common thing. You could see in that in that case, um, where, where which had the nephrolith and then had the uh, bladder worms, that um, um, yeah, a, a blood clot can look like soft tissue, um, and often does look like soft tissue in the in the bladder. So differentiating whether we've got a mass um, or a blood clot is is kind of key. So. Yeah, absolutely. Moving the animal from one side uh, recumbency to another, um, we can see if that is mobile within the bladder. So if it's moving and falling to the dependent side, that helps us to also assess whether there's anywhere it's adhered to the wall. Um, obviously, a mass is more likely to be um, <laughs> adhered or grow out from um, a portion of the wall putting color flow mapping on. So using Doppler to assess if there's any blood flow within the area. Um, soft tissue mass um, should have some blood flow within it. It might be tricky to pick up on, but if it has blood flow, it's definitely not a blood clot. Um, and yeah, shaking that, that, that bladder as well can, can be useful to, to assess that. Okay. Uh, people want to know where you got your uh, cysto model so they can practice your cysto model. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a um, it's a company in the UK, um, SPI Investigations, I think it's called. Um, <clears throat> it's a pretty cool phantom. <laughs> nice. I feel like we could use it in humans too, just to, just for needle practice. But you've talked about 
other ways to get needle practice too, right? Could you, maybe you could like touch on some of those real fast. Yeah. So, um, yeah, di- various different things. So, um, jelly or jello, um, you can use and put olives in. Um, that's a really quick, cheap way of t- trying tofu as well is a really good, um, phantom, um, which you can hide food in and mm-hmm. also a, a lump of meat wrapped with cling film. That's another way um, that you can, um, simulate, um, and practice fine needle aspirations. That's probably the most realistic one is uh, a lump of meat, but uh, <laughs> feels a bit wasteful, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so maybe for especially for veterinarians, not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, when is are you you talk about doing a traumatic catheterization, uh, or some people talk about an expressed urine sample um, versus cysto? Like, when do you kind of choose, or when do you uh, go straight to the cysto? Yeah. So um, if it, if I'm if I'm seeing sediment or sludge within the bladder, then a cystocentesis is great. If I'm concerned about the bladder wall at all, um, then I will usually um, try and do other techniques first rather than sticking a needle in. Um, so trying trying traumatic catheterization um, to try and obtain a few cells from the region and really using um, ultrasound to make sure that the catheter is in the correct location. So the cells I'm getting are mostly going to be from that region um, is really useful. So it's still ultrasound guided. It's just uh, not using a needle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe we can squeeze a couple more in. Um, when you do see say, uh, an enlarged kidney and ureter, but the bladder is empty, what's your next steps and your differential diagnosis there? Okay. Um, so, well, I, I'd, if, if you've got a dilated ureter, you've, you've got to be concerned about an obstruction there. Um, and, um, it, it may well be that they've, um, got got function over their bladder and are able to empty that normally. But um, yeah, it depends if you've got a complete obstruction of a ureter and if that's bilaterally, then you're going to struggle to get any urine into the bladder um, at all. So I would definitely be checking both sides um, to, to assess whether we've got a bilateral issue um, and whether we can see the obstruction, whether we can follow that ureter all the way down to the bladder and see where the ureters enter the bladder because it will depend on the patient's age as well if we've got ectopic um, ureters or whether we've got um, stones that are blocking the ureters or even a mass. So it will. Um, the, there's many, many differentials there. But, yeah, certainly doing that systematic assessment of viewing both kidneys and the bladder. And if we can follow the ureters following them as well, that will gain, gain us the most u- uh, useful information. Nice. And uh, last question is, um, you know, where can people learn pathology uh, and learn how to kind of get better at some of the scans you discussed? Yeah. So um, obviously you've got um, a, a lot of videos on, on Clarius. I've made lots of videos for you guys on cases. Um, but yeah, on uh, the FOVU courses, we go through a lot of pathology as well, because getting your eye in on uh, pathology is is really um, a key thing. Getting your eye in on what's normal, and then it helps you to spot what's abnormal as well. So yeah, uh, lots of resources with Clarius, lots with FOVU as well. So Great. Okay. Well, uh, thanks so much. We're at the top of the hour. We want to respect everyone's time. Uh, other questions that we didn't get to in the Q&A, we will make sure to do our best to follow up on those afterward. And Janez, uh, you want to close us out here? Yes, we've got a lot of questions. We will follow up with you by email uh, in the coming days or week. Um, you will, again, just a reminder that you all receive a copy of the webinar recording by email this week, as well as a link to the PDF of the presentation. Please do complete our closing survey to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring you great educational content like today. I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Edwards and also thanking Dr. Frankel and Shelley and all of our furry supporting characters. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope you'll join us again in January for our next webinar. And in the meantime, please keep scanning. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.